Hi, I'm John Edmiston, and this is Biblical EQ. It's the second session, The Role of the Holy Spirit. In the last session, we saw that the Holy Spirit is God, resident in human personality with the power to change it. That the Holy Spirit can change and transform you from glory to glory. And that each day, God is moving in you, in your life, to make you more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. As we go through this session, you will learn valuable principles about how God is at work in your life to make you a more emotionally stable person, to make you a person with the emotions of the Lord Jesus Christ, to make you a person who is full of love and joy and peace and the power of the Holy Spirit. You can find today's notes on our website at biblicaleq.com. And you can find my book, Biblical EQ, a Christian handbook for emotional transformation on amazon.com. Just type in Biblical EQ. Before we go into today's before we go into today's session, let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you will anoint today's session with special power. I ask that every person that watches this DVD will be blessed. I ask that your word will be opened and that truth will be spoken. And that these words will not be just the words of a man, the words of a Bible teacher, but may be your words speaking to human hearts. I pray for every person that watches this DVD, but that they may come to know Christ more deeply and may come to know the work of the Holy Spirit more truly. And that your word will enter into their body, soul and spirit and transform them. And that this work that is done today will not be the work of a man, but may be the work of God to the glory of God forever. Amen. As I said before, the Holy Spirit is God, resident in human personality with the power to change it. The Holy Spirit has the wisdom, power and knowledge to make us like Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit knows who Jesus is and the Holy Spirit knows who you and I are and the Holy Spirit has, is creative and powerful and has the ability to change you or I into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how to change myself. For a start, I don't really know who I am. I have only a partial knowledge of myself. And I don't know all the steps in between that I would need to take and the order those steps would be taken in for me to become like Jesus. I don't have a perfect knowledge of who Jesus is. So how am I going to know how to become like Jesus if I don't know myself and I don't know Jesus and I don't know the steps in between and I don't have the power to do it. It's a hopeless task for me to try to change myself. But God can change me because God knows who I am and God knows who Jesus is and God has infinite wisdom and knows all the little steps and side steps and that things that must be done to change me or you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is the only person, and I use person with a capital P, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy Spirit lives in you and I, and the Holy Spirit communicates with God Almighty, and through that interaction, the Holy Spirit changes us day to day into the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit had a very large role in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our model and who is our example, and who is at the centre of Biblical EQ. We don't put secular psychology at the centre, though it can be useful, but we put Jesus at the centre, and we put God's Word at the centre. So we first of all, we've got to ask, how did the Holy Spirit work in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? First of all, we find that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, and that's in Matthew 1, verse 20. That's the virgin birth. And we find in the book of Hebrews that it says that God prepared the body of Jesus to do the will of God. Let's look at that verse for a moment. It's not well known. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 7. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. So God prepared a body for Jesus so that he could do God's will. It was a body free from sinful impulses, a body free from lusts and passions and genetic defects. It was a body prepared to do the will of God. And the Holy Spirit, we find, also gave wisdom and power to Jesus. 
Let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and, sh and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. So we find that the Spirit of the Lord rested on Jesus and gave him wisdom and understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord, and that this Holy Spirit was preparing Jesus for ministry and gave him that sense of righteousness and, and insight into people so he did not judge by what the eyes saw or the ears heard. So this insight, this wisdom, this power, this intellect was given by the Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ. The transforming work of the Holy Spirit was always operating in the life of Jesus from his conception right through. Jesus was always the Son of God. He's been the Son of God from eternity. He's the fullness of deity in bodily form. He didn't become God, but he did experience a special anointing of the Holy Spirit at his baptism. In fact, his personality changed so greatly at his baptism that the people in Nazareth, who had just thought that he was the carpenter's son, who had just seen him as a normal human being and hadn't gained any insight to the fact that he was the Son of God. When he came back after his baptism, they, they marveled at it. They said, where did he get this wisdom from? Because he would got the wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that in Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 58. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, except in his own country and in his own house. Now we did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So the people at Nazareth, seeing Jesus come back, said, Where did he get this wisdom from? He's He's changed. Something's happened to him and he's suddenly this wise man. He's suddenly this prophet. But we just think he's the carpenter's son. And so we find that the Holy Spirit gave wisdom to Jesus, gave intelligence to Jesus, gave Jesus a perfect body, gave Jesus a powerful spirit for ministry. So the body, mind and spirit of Jesus were brought into perfect harmony and obedience to God by the Holy Spirit. Now what Jesus does, what God does for Jesus God can do for you because we are in Christ. We're in the realm of Christ's work. So what God has done for Christ, God does for us. We have died with Christ. We have risen with Christ. Uh, we have been seated in heavenly realms with Christ. And so the work of God in Christ is a work that can be done in our lives, but not quite the same way. We never become Jesus Christ, but we become like Jesus Christ. And so that work is available to us. We find, for instance, that the Holy Spirit will renew our minds, that we, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, and Romans 8, 4 to 6 says, If our mind is set on the Spirit, we will have life and peace. We, in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 to 16, we find the Holy Spirit works in the mind of the believer to give the believer insight into the Scriptures and insight into things that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the mind of man. We also find in Romans 8 verse 11 that the Holy Spirit gives life to our mortal bodies. Our mortal bodies can be given life by the work of the Holy Spirit. Sinful habits can be broken, addictions can be shattered. People who come to Christ give up smoking, give up drugs, give up heroin, uh, give up morphine addiction, give up uh, prescription painkiller addictions. They come to Christ and they are transformed and their body is cleaned out because the Holy Spirit gives life to our mortal bodies in healing and it also in the breaking of addictive habits and things that have occupied our body for a long while and taken control of us. The Holy Spirit can also change our emotions. We find in Galatians 5, 23, the well-known list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that 
The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. Our character is renewed, our emotions are renewed, our ability to love and rejoice and, and bless others is renewed. Our entire emotional state uh, is founded on the work of the Holy Spirit uh, who brings this love, joy and peace into our life. We also find that in the Christian life, the love of God is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit in Romans 5 verse 5. And that we are strengthened to endure trials because we have this love of God. And we find that patience and endurance produces character and character hope. And we can withstand the trials and afflictions of ministry and of life. And we realize that we are coming into a surpassing weight of glory. And we are given a new heavenly perspective from which we can look at life from the eternal perspective and see our trials as bringing us a reward rather than being overwhelmed by them. And we find that the Holy Spirit helps us to become strong and to grow into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are strengthened in the inner man so that we can know the love of God. And with all the saints, we can come to know the height and width and depth of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and be filled to all the fullness of God. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, a wonderful passage. And in this series, we'll look at it in greater depth. And we find out that the Holy Spirit is our counselor, our helper and our teacher. He is given to us to remind us of all things, to bring us back into the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's in John 14, verse 26. In 1 John, chapter 2, verses 20 and 27, the Holy Spirit is an anointing, and this anointing helps us to know all things. This anointing gives us discernment and wisdom, helps us to know the things of God and to discern right from wrong. And the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual senses through which we can discern good and evil. And that's in Hebrews 5 and verse 14. And so the Holy Spirit becomes our teacher and writes the law of God in our heart, Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10. And we find the Holy Spirit teaching us and loving us and blessing us and bringing in us into a spirit of wisdom and understanding and revelation. And I think that's in Colossians 1 verse 9 uh, and I think Philippians 1 verse 9 as well. The Holy Spirit gives us power for ministry. The Holy Spirit can come upon you to make you a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a very well-known verse. So the Holy Spirit can give you power and wisdom and love and good character and good emotions and a renewed body and a renewed mind. So this is a very quick summary of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let's just go through that list again. The Holy Spirit renews our minds. The Holy Spirit gives life to our mortal bodies. The Holy Spirit gives us good character and good emotions. The Holy Spirit pours the love of God into our hearts, helps us to endure trials, helps us to become strong spiritually and grow into the image of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit teaches us all things, reveals to us the things of God as our counselor, helper and teacher and our anointing. And the Holy Spirit gives us power for ministry. So that's just some of the works of the Holy Spirit. So. The Holy Spirit can work a fundamental transformation, a fundamental change in your life. No matter how bad you are, no matter how messed up you are, the Holy Spirit can change you and transform you. Now, the most messed up people in the entire Greco-Roman world, the world that Paul went and preached in, the most messed up people of all lived in a town called Corinth. Corinth was on a narrow isthmus in, the, in Greece. It was a seafaring uh, area where there was a port on either side and sometimes the boats were actually carted across the isthmus uh, to go from one side and they would just like the Panama Canal uh, and uh, so in, in Corinth they had this huge temple uh, a, a temple to Aphrodite a uh, basically a sex goddess uh, and the sailors would go up to the temple and do what sailors do and this, the, the town had become polluted by sin, by sex, by drunkenness, by immorality. Uh, there was barely a marriage that worked. The, there was crime, there was pickpocketing, there was murder, there was thuggery. There was everything going on in this wild, wild city of Corinth. And it had such a bad reputation that to play the Corinthian was considered an uh, insult throughout the entire Roman Empire, which says it meant you were very base and vulgar uh, in a moral way. So the gospel came to Corinth and some of these Corinthians got saved and some of these Corinthians got changed and some of these Corinthians got transformed. And let's look at some verses about that. Verses that are somehow a little bit controversial these days, but verses that are nonetheless the word of God. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So these Corinthians had life-dominating problems. Some of them were criminals. They were thieves. Uh, some of them were addicted to substances. They were drunkards. Some of them were addicted to material things. They were covetous. Uh, some of them were, uh, were, had foul mouths. They were revilers. Others were extortioners, uh, going in with billy clubs and beating people up and getting money from them. Others had sexual problems. They were fornicators and adulterers and homosexuals and sodomites. They had all kinds of sexual problems. Some had spiritual problems. They were idolaters. They were addicted to collecting idols in their house. So the houses were cluttered with uh, this kind of statue, that kind of statue, and this kind of magic charm. And there were all these kinds of people in Corinth, and they had these severe spiritual, moral, and substance abuse problems. But Christ changed them. They were washed. They were sanctified. They were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. These Corinthians were changed. Despite having these terrible, terrible life problems, these problems lost their grip on the Corinthians. And Christ gained a grip on the Corinthians. And the Holy Spirit changed the Corinthians and washed them and sanctified them. So these problems were no longer problems. They were no longer drunkards. They were no longer thieves or extortioners or adulterers or homosexuals. They were no longer fornicating because the Holy Spirit changed them. So even lifelong patterns of sin, of addiction, of promiscuity, of, even of criminality can be dealt with by the Holy Spirit. Such changes may seem impossible to man, but they are not impossible to God the Holy Spirit. For what seems impossible to man is possible with God, and all things are possible to him who believes. If you believe that God can change you, and God wants to change you, and God will change you, then God uh, has a plan to change you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have to lay hold of that. That God has a transforming work that he wants to do in your life. And he has given you the power to make those changes through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who was involved in the very creation of the world, who hovered over the waters. This Holy Spirit that had the power to change the face of the earth can change your life. And can even deal with the physical and medical basis of addictions and sin. I had a great-grandfather who was a missionary in China, and he was a doctor. He was a medical missionary. He went out with the great missionary Hudson Taylor, uh, and he was one of Hudson Taylor's uh, uh, main side uh, co-workers. Uh, and uh, my great-grandfather uh, went out in the early days of the China Inland Mission, and he had uh, shingles, a very painful disease of the nerves, where they, uh, uh, I'm not a, a medical but it's, I believe it's extremely painful. And back in those days, for pain, they gave you morphine. Morphine was abundant in China. So they gave my great-grandfather morphine, and my great-grandfather became addicted to it. Now, as a missionary, he was ashamed of being a morphine addict. He said, I need to get free from this. And he had an abundant supply of it because he was a doctor. And so he pleaded with the Lord to remove this morphine addiction from his life. And the Lord sent him into a deep sleep for three or four days. And after this deep sleep, he woke up with no desire for morphine whatsoever and could just put it away. God changed his physical body. God got rid of that addiction because he pleaded with the Lord for God to change the physical addiction that was going on. God changed his nervous system so he no longer craved that morphine. The Holy Spirit created the body of Jesus to perfectly express the will of God and be free from the tendency to sin. God can do that for your body as well. God can remove the sinful tendencies out of your body as part of the process of sanctification. You don't have to be dominated by any disease or by any craving. You don't have to, be, to give in to dieting fads. You don't have to give in to anorexia or bulimia. You don't have to give in to body image problems. 
You don't have to give in to drugs or to drunkenness or to marijuana or to addiction to prescription painkillers. You don't have to give in to any physical uh, lust or immorality or homosexuality or fornication or adultery. You don't have to sleep around. Your body can be renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit so it no longer sins. God can change your body. It says in Galatians 5, 16 to 18. Let's have a look at that. Galatians 5, 16 to 18. This is a verse you really want to write down or underline in your Bible. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Let's go back to that first verse. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to change your body, change your mind, change your character so you have greater self-control, and you will not walk in sin anymore. You will not walk according to the lust of the flesh, but you will walk according to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit can deal with the flesh both in its spiritual and biological aspects. You are not left at the mercy of your genetics. You are not left at the mercy of your addictions. To give a very simple example of this, there are some people who say, I have to argue, I have to fight because it's the Irish in me. It's my genetics. I've got red hair, I've got freckles. I, I, it's just part of my nature to be angry. And there are people who say that. But our law around the country says you can't get in fights. And if you are too angry at people, the boss will fire you or things like this. You, you, that person has to bring their anger uh, under control and they just can't blame their genetics. There are a lot of people who have a genetic predisposition to sin. They may have a genetic predisposition to be promiscuous. They may come from a long line of, of promiscuous fathers, mothers, uncles and aunts. They may be hardwired into them. But God can change that and they have to bring it under control. No matter if our sin is right in our nature, no matter if it's as, as, as fundamental to us as resentment or anger or promiscuity, God can change that because you are not at the mercy of your genes. God can change your genetics. He can change your hardwired physical nature to bring your body into the conformity of the, the will of God. The Holy Spirit can put to death sinful tendencies within you. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. Actually, let's go back uh, to verse 9. We'll go 9 to 13. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the Spirit puts to death the deeds of the body. The Spirit overcomes the lust of the flesh. So we can walk in righteousness. We actually have hope that God can overcome our fleshly lusts so we can walk in the Spirit. What God did in Christ, he wants to do for you. God gave Jesus a body that was obedient to God. God wants to give you a body that's obedient to God. As you follow Jesus, Christ in you takes control of you, body, soul, mind, and spirit, so that your body becomes that which does the will of God. As well as having a body, Jesus had a spirit and a soul. And in fact, there are 11 references to the spirit and soul of Jesus in the Gospels, and we don't have time to go through them all. They're Matthew 26, 38, 27, 50, Mark 2, 8, Mark 8, 12, Mark 14, 34, and in Luke 10, 21, 23, 46, and in the Gospel of John, John 11, 33, 12, 27, 13, 21, and 19, 30. They're all in the book. Okay. But three things stand out. Firstly, that Jesus perceived life's situations with his spirit. That Jesus was moved on the basis of those perceptions. And that Jesus candidly expressed his emotions to those around him. So when Jesus walked into a situation, say the man with the withered hand, 
and the Pharisees are there. And Jesus perceives in his spirit that the Pharisees are hard-hearted, that they're cruel, that they want to deny this man the healing he has come to Jesus for because it's the Sabbath. When Jesus is there, he perceives the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees with his spirit. And he makes us a, a, an assessment not based on what the eye sees or the ear hears, but upon his spiritual reading of the spirit of the Pharisees. After his spirit has made that perception, an emotion is generated in Jesus. And he says, Jesus became angry when he saw the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees. And then finally, Jesus candidly expresses his emotions or expresses it. And he says to the man with the withered hand, come here, and he heals them. And then Jesus tells a parable uh, about uh, an ox or something being liberated on the Sabbath day. And he rebukes the Pharisees to their face. Jesus perceives in his spirit, because that spirit is given to him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And so Jesus has a sense of perceptions of life. Now, we all have perceptions of life. We perceive life in different ways. We have a framework. Some of us perceive life with a cynical standpoint, some with a believing standpoint. Some of us perceive life positively, some very negatively. Uh, we all perceive life in various ways. We read situations. And Jesus read life situations with the Holy Spirit, not with his own suspicions or paranoias or fear. And the Holy Spirit gave Jesus extraordinary knowledge and wisdom to perceive things correctly so that Jesus knew the heart of things. It says in John 2 verse 24, Jesus did not commit himself to men because he knew their hearts. He knew all men. So Jesus had an insight, an extraordinary insight into people and how they were thinking and what they were going on. And he had the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and knowledge that was given to him by God so that he could see into the heart of life situations and express truth to those situations. His power and insight was from the Holy Spirit. After Jesus perceived these situations, after he saw them truthfully with the, the Holy Spirit, he saw them through the word of God, he saw them through God's eyes, this perception then led to a belief or an emotion being generated within Jesus. Jesus' perceptions of situations led to his emotional reactions. He perceived their heart of heart, he became angry. For instance, on sensing the darkness of his impending death, his soul was troubled. On seeing the grief at Lazarus's tomb, he groaned in spirit and was troubled and, and, and wept. When the, the disciples returned victorious, he rejoiced. When he perceived the hardness of the heart of the Pharisees, he became angry. When he saw masses of people coming out after healing, he had great compassion and mercy and healed them. And he expressed these emotions powerfully but appropriately. There's always great dignity in the reactions of Jesus Christ. He's never mawkish, he's never sentimental, he's never all over the place emotionally. There's always dignity, there's always clarity, there's depth, uh, and there's always an appropriate expression, and he's never trivial or sentimental or chaotic. The way Jesus had his emotions helps us to understand our emotions. Firstly, Jesus perceives life spiritually, so we should perceive life spiritually, righteously and truthfully. We should look at life through the word of God, not through our own understanding. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, lean not on your own understanding. Uh, cast your burdens on the Lord. Look at life through God's truth and God's perspective. Then after we've perceived life spiritually, we need to react in our soul and spirit. We need to be moved by life, not aloof and detached or cold and hard. We, we don't back off from life. We don't say, oh, well, I'm going to be detached. I'm going to be uh, off in another realm. Now we enter into life just like Jesus who became incarnate and walked among men and, and who wept and who was crucified and who was right there in the midst of people in the midst of crowds. And he was moved by life and he wept at Lazarus's tomb. We then express those reactions with dignity, power and poise. Jesus expressed his emotions with a full-hearted emotionality. He even uh, wept with drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he was always wise in his expression. Now, as well as perceptions, we find that beliefs are important to our emotions. Beliefs lie behind many emotions. What you believe about a situation affects how you feel about the situation. When I was a small child, my brother and I went down to the local creek and discovered what we thought was gold. It was gold-coloured rocks and brought it home to my father, who was an engineer, and said, 
we're rich, we're rich. We found this huge pile of gold down the creek and uh, the Royal Alluvial Creeks in Australia and gold rushes. Uh, we're going to become uh, millionaires. It's, uh, and my father just laughed and said, no, you haven't found gold. You've found fool's gold, iron pyrites, iron sulphide. And so our joy changed to disappointment. The only thing that had changed in the universe at that point was our belief. At one point, we believed the rock was gold, so we were happy. Next, we believed the rock was iron pyrites, so we became disappointed. The rock did not change. My family did not change. Our income did not change. Nothing in the world changed except our belief about that rock. And what happened was, as our belief changed from this is gold to this is not gold, we went from happy to disappointed simply because our belief changed. As our belief changed, our emotions changed. So what we believe uh, has a huge influence on how we feel. When Jesus went into the temple and saw the money changes around, he didn't say, oh, this is a good business, I've got to get in on it. He didn't, because his belief was that the temple was a place of prayer for all nations. Jesus did not see this as a wonderful business opportunity. He saw it as corruption. And he became furious and made a whip and drove them out of the temple because he, his belief system about the holiness of the temple created an emotion in him of defending his father's glory. Now, Jesus could do that because the temple was his house. He belonged to Jesus. He was the son of God. He was God. He could clean his own house. We can't go into someone else's church and get a whip and do that kind of thing. Uh, we're not entitled to do that because it's not our house. Uh, but it was Jesus's house. He owned it. He's the son of God. He, he dwelt in the mercy seat above the cherubim. Uh, he was God Almighty in human flesh, the fullness of deity and bodily form. He was entitled to clean out the temple. So he did, because his beliefs about what that temple should have been there were being violated, and that created great uh, holy anger, a righteous indignation within him. Uh, Jesus' belief about faith uh, caused him to rejoice when he met the centurion. He said, I've not seen such great faith in all Israel. And he rejoiced at the faith of the centurion. Uh, in fact, he marveled at it. When the 72 came back and he said he saw that Satan fall from heaven like lightning and he rejoiced that God had revealed these things to the, the babes and to people who lacked formal education and wisdom uh, but had hidden them from the wise. Jesus' belief about his powers and about the power of God and that nothing was impossible to, with God led to him to master many situations that would have frightened a normal person such as when they were out on the storm in the Lake of Galilee, he just stood up and said, peace, be still, and the storm went still because he believed he could do that. He was totally calm because he knew he was in charge of that situation. So his beliefs influenced his emotions. So we find that as we uh, have an emotion in our personality, the first stage is we perceive the situation. We look into a situation, we see the temple uh, cluttered with doves or whatever, there is a perception about what's going on. That perception then interacts with our beliefs. The temple should be a holy place. And an emotion is generated, righteous indignation. That emotion then interacts with our physical disposition, which is being renewed by God. In this case, Jesus made a whip. That was his physical interaction with that. And finally, the outward expression of the emotional reaction, Jesus cleanses the temple. So perception, belief, internal emotion generated, interaction with our physical disposition, outward expression of the emotional reaction. Actually, perhaps the other way around. Fundamentally, we have the perception of the situation, how we see life. Then our perception interacts with our belief. The belief then generates an emotion about the rock or about the temple or about the storm. Once the emotion is generated, that emotion then interacts via our hormonal system, via our brain, via various regions in our body. It interacts with our body and then there is an outward expression of the emotional reaction. We speak spiritual things in spiritual words taught to us by God. For each of those five stages, perception, belief, internal emotion, physical interaction, and outward expression, each of those five for Jesus was controlled by the Holy Spirit. And Christians also need to allow the Holy Spirit to transform each of these five steps. Jesus perceived with his spirit and the Holy Spirit gave him the perceptions that he needed in life to minister. Jesus had beliefs that were formed within him by the Holy Spirit and were formed by the word of God. We find that during the temptation, 
he quoted from scripture. His beliefs were coming out of the book of Deuteronomy at that point. And so the Holy Spirit wrote the law of God on, into Jesus' heart. And the Holy Spirit can write the law of God into our heart so our beliefs are true and correct. And as our beliefs become true and correct, our emotions will become true and correct. As our beliefs are corrected, our, our internal emotions are corrected. And the Holy Spirit can give us righteous internal emotions. The Holy Spirit can put an emotion into your heart so that you weep for the lost or, or you'll groan and travail in prayer or so you have compassion. These are emotions generated by the Holy Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. The Holy Spirit generates these emotions within you. The Holy Spirit helps us to interact with our physical disposition by renewing our body and causing us to cry out, Abba, Father, and giving life to our mortal bodies which we saw earlier. And finally, the Holy Spirit helps us with the outward expression of our emotional reaction. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So what about the Holy Spirit and our EQ, our emotional intelligence? The Holy Spirit formed the body, mind, soul, spirit, and beliefs of Jesus. The Holy Spirit produced godly emotions in Jesus. The Holy Spirit can also form godly emotions in Christians. We need to have the godly emotions of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit can produce them in us. The Holy Spirit can change the way you and I see things so that we see life in a more godly, positive, faith-filled fashion. The Holy Spirit can create functional and true beliefs which underlie healthy emotions. These beliefs can be created in your life and my life through the study of the Word, through praying the Scripture into our life, through worship, through many other things which we'll look at later on in this course. So the Holy Spirit can help you and I to renew our minds and renew our belief system. The, the Holy Spirit can directly generate godly and spiritual emotions in you and I. The Holy Spirit can deal with, de with difficult fleshly impulses. The Holy Spirit can help us to walk in the Spirit and deny the lusts of the flesh. The Holy Spirit can teach us what to say and how to say it. So the Holy Spirit is critical to your emotional health and my emotional health. As you allow the Holy Spirit to move in you, you will find yourself becoming a better person. Why not start off each day asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit? As it says in uh, Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine for that is dissipation. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to talk about rejoicing and singing and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So. As we are filled with the Holy Spirit, new emotions will be generated within us and we will find ourselves singing and rejoicing in God. Why don't you ask God, the Holy Spirit, to come into your life and to transform it now and to fill you with the joy of the Lord? And why don't you do that every day so that you can grow from glory to glory into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's Biblical EQ Session 2. You can find all this material on our website at biblicaleq.com. And this is John Edmondson signing off. Be blessed.